Okay. Um, well, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation to speak to you today and for making space uh, for our Quantum Foundation's talk in this Quantum Technology Workshop. I don't think I need to convince this audience of the importance of foundations for the development of quantum information. And as the field continues to grow, I think it will be beneficial, uh, continue to be beneficial for both fields to keep this close contact. I've changed the title of my talk to make a more direct connection with quantum technology and to reflect what makes me most excited about the possibility of one day having a very large quantum computer. And that would be the possibility to perform an ultimate experimental test of this uh, recent no goal theorem on the wigner strand paradox by myself and co-authors. One of the key messages that I want to convey in this talk is that this result has foundational implications beyond Bell's theorem. Whereas Bell's theorem forces us to deal with the puzzle of entanglement, our no goal theorem forces us to deal with what I would say is the most important puzzle in quantum foundations, which is the measurement problem, which is paradigmatically illustrated by wigner strand paradox. So let's remind ourselves of wigner strand paradox. It was proposed in 1961 by Eugene Wigner when he said, the wave function is only a suitable language for describing the body of knowledge gained by observations, which is relevant for predicting the future behavior of the system. For this reason, the interactions which may create one or another sensation in us are also called observations or measurements. It is natural to inquire about the situation if one does not make the observation oneself, but lets someone else carry it out. So we represent this scenario here where the friend is in an isolated lab, receives a system uh, S in some state psi, and measures it on some fixed basis. And Wigner says, one could attribute a wave function to the joint system, friend uh, plus object, and this joint system would also have a wave function after the interaction that is after my friend has looked. So let's say that the, the Wigner describes the friend as being initially in a ready state R. And what it means for the friend to measure S, say, on the computational basis, is of course just that if S is initially in state zero, the friend state will change to encode that information, say, to a state O zero, and the state of S will be left unchanged if it's an ideal non-disturbing measurement and similarly if S is in state one initially. If on the other hand, the system is in some superposition of uh, the basis states, textbook quantum mechanics says that after the measurement, the system and of course the friend's measurement record will be in one or another of those states with a probability given by the board rule. On the other hand, if the friend's lab is isolated from the external environment, then according to the unitary evolution postulate, Wigner can describe the joint state of S and uh, the friend after the measure interaction as an entangled superposition such as state three. And here the subscript F of course uh, refers to the friend, the device and everything else inside the lab that directly or indirectly interacts with the system S. And Wigner concluded that this is a contradiction because the wave function three describes a state that has properties which neither one nor two has. And this is in a nutshell the measurement problem or one, one uh, way to to express it. Now, you may avoid this conclusion if, say, you consider those quantum states describing not states of reality, but states of information. Then one and two could be simply interpreted as describing situations where the friend has more information than Wigner. Incidentally, thinking of the wave function as epistemic also uh, allows for a resolution of the EPR paradox, but not of Bell's theorem. So can we make a stronger argument? Some recent results have proposed no-go theorems uh, based on extensions of Wigner's friend scenario to include multiple observers and entanglement. The more commented one of these is uh, the theorem by Frahin and Renner, and it's a very interesting result. One drawback is that it's not theory independent in the sense that it contains assumptions that are specifically about quantum mechanics, much like Wigner's original argument. Our work is um, instead based on another scenario that was introduced by, by Charles Lapruckner in this paper, uh, and he had an interesting intuition that the friend's observations could replace the hidden variable in a bell type scenario. But the uh, metaphysical assumptions in his theorem were just as strong as those in Bell's theorem. Our theorem has weaker assumptions, than, as I will explain. So what is the scenario in, in this scenario introduced by Charles We consider a bipartite uh, version of Wigner's friend thought experiment. We can do also with just one friend, but I'll use the bipartite for simplicity. Where now there's two friends, Charlie and Debbie, who initially share an entangled state and perform measurement on some fixed basis and obtain outcomes C and D. Alice and Bob are outside of the lab and by assumption they can perform arbitrary or close enough to arbitrary quantum operations on the whole contents of their respective friends' labs. And they're for the reason called super observers. 
Now, if Alice chooses x equals 1, uh, the protocol goes, she will simply open the lab and ask Charlie what he observed and set her own outcome A to be equal to that of Charlie. If she chooses another setting, say 2 or 3, she will perform another measurement, which can be implemented by reversing the unitary evolution that entangled Charlie with the system, erasing Charlie's memory in the process, and then proceed to perform a measurement on the system alone, which has now been returned to its original entangled state with a distant lab. And the various events that we consider are represented in this uh, space-time diagram. So we call local friendliness the conjunction of three metaphysical assumptions. And by metaphysical, I mean assumptions about physical theories. And also the assertion that in taken separately, uh, they cannot be disproved, but taken in conjunction, they lead to a contradiction with physics of quantum mechanics. It's absoluteness of observed events, locality in the sense of what's usually called parameter independence, and no superdeterminism, which is equivalent to what's usually called freedom of choice. And from these, we derive, I'll, I'll explain in a minute what they are. From these, we derive local friendliness inequalities, which are constraints on the observable probabilities by Ellis and Bob, similarly to a Bell inequality. And we showed that if a super observer like Alice and Bob can perform arbitrary quantum operations in an observance environment, they can be violated in principle. And we perform proof of principle experiments demonstrating their violation. We can also replace locality and freedom of choice by uh, another assumption that we call local action, which is a more natural assumption, simply to state. So I prefer to, to uh, formulate it in these terms now. So what are these assumptions exactly? Absoluteness of observed events is the assumption that an observed event is an absolute single event. It's not relative to anything or anyone. Um, so in particular, implies that in each run of the experiment, note that all of the variables that go in here, they are operational variables to some observer. The C and D in particular are observed by Shelley and by that Debbie by assumption. And what this implies is that they have some well-defined absolute value that is not dependent on the observer in each run. So in particular, there's a joint probability distribution for A, B, C, D, conditional on the choices of setting X, Y, of Alice and Bob, such that you, you recover the marginals appropriately. And by construction, when Alice chooses x equals 1, a equals c, and when Bob chooses y equals 1, b equals d. And I emphasize this is not the assumption that unperformed experiments have results. It's the assumption that performed experiments have absolute results. The experiments performed by some observer have observer-independent results. And local action is the assumption that the only relevant events correlated with an intervention, there is a free choice uh, in its future light cone. And in our scenario, it implies the same mathematical consequences as locality and freedom of choice. Um, and again, this is in the sense of primary independence, where the probability of, say, the outcome of Alice is independent of Bob's choice Y, even when conditioned on other events which are not in the future light cone of Y, similarly for Bob's outcome. And this is the assumption that the observations C and D by Charlie and Debbie are independent of the future uh, choice of measurement by Alice and Bob. And I emphasize this is not Bell's notion of local causality. Local causality is locality or parameter independence plus another assumption that's sometimes called outcome independence. It can be, it can be factorized in this way, which requires that Alice's outcome A is independent of Bob's outcome B, given a complete specification of hidden variables, lambda in the past like cone of A, which are its potential causes. And we do not make that assumption. So to emphasize uh, the, how this differs from Bell's theorem, let me put these concepts in the diagram to drive home the message. We can derive Bell inequalities from these four assumptions. Absolutes of observed events is also required. It's implicit in uh, almost every derivation, but it's also uh, required and the, the other three assumptions there. And to note that outcome independence is implied by predetermination of, of measurement outcomes or determinism. We can also replace the other two by local action, as I just, uh, as I just argued, which is a more natural assumption. And one alternative to resolve Bell's theorem, it's a popular one, has been to reject these concepts in gray while keeping the ones in blue. And this allowed for what Shimony called a peaceful co coexistence between quantum mechanics and relativity, the idea being that violation of local action is an objectionable form of action at a distance, whereas violation of outcome independence only represented a mild form of uh, passion at a distance. However, we can derive the local friendliness inequalities only from these two assumptions. Outcome independence is not required. So this route for 
peaceful coexistence between quantum mechanics and relativity that is available for Bell inequalities is not available to resolve our no goal theorem. This can be further illustrated by looking at the correlation polytopes. This is an actual 2D cut on uh, the set of correlations for the case of three settings and two outcomes per site, which is the, the first case where the two polytopes come apart. And so here in green, that's the local hidden variable polytope. The local friendliness polytope uh, contains the local hidden variable and also the orange areas. And that plus the uh, purple is the null signaling polytope. And the red line is the boundary of quantum correlations. So here you can see that the local friendliness inequalities can be violated by quantum mechanics, say around here and here. So there will be the violation of these facets there and there. Um, and also, there are some points which violate some Bell inequality, like, like here, but do not violate a local friendliness inequality. And this is not directly implied by this diagram, but we have shown that by deriving all of the 932 uh, inequalities for this scenario. And this is a reflection of the fact that uh, I was just discussing that the assumptions they're going to derive in these inequalities are strictly weaker than the assumptions needed to derive regarding quality. So that means that their violation has strictly stronger implications. They rule out a larger class of models. Incidentally, after Howard Wiseman presented these results in a conference, uh, it was brought to our attention that these polytopes had been previously studied by uh, Eric Woodhead, which was, was a student of um, Stefan Pironia, um, uh, under the name of partially deterministic polytopes. And he has this information theoretic interpretation as the sets of phenomena for which randomness cannot be certified device independently in the presence of a null signaling anniversary. And uh, this connection has actually been very little um, explored so far. So clarifying that connection is, is an interesting topic for further research for those of you interested in device independent quantum information. So finally, we performed a proof of principle experiment with polarization entangled photons. Here, the role of the friend is played by the path that a photon takes after this polarizing beam splitter. So here's Charlie and that's Levy. The photon polarization becomes entangled with the path, which can be interpreted as the path measuring the, polar the polarization. And Ellis opening the lab and asking Charlie what he saw corresponds to inserting in this motorized mirror to deflect the beams and detect the path. There is detect Charlie's memory. And the other measurements are performed by unitarily reversing the entanglement between the path and the polarization and then measuring the polarization alone, depending on the placement of some being uh, displaced at some, some, some wave place. And um, these are the states that we test, uh, the mixture of a single state with weight mu and a classically correlated state chosen for practical experimental reasons. And these are the results we have obtained. So here we have the left hand side of the that presents the first inequality of each of these various classes, which are violated as you increase the weight uh, of mu of the singlet state. Values above zero represent a violation of the corresponding inequality. And the two things to note here is that one, the blue line is a bell inequality, which is not a facet of the local friendliness polytope. So here's a data point that shows that um, uh, you can demonstrate bell non-locality uh, without violating any local friendliness inequalities. All these other points demonstrate violations of local friendliness by quantum mechanics. And in particular, another interesting one is the orange, which are genuine local friendliness inequalities. There are inequalities which are not facets of the corresponding Bell polytope. So all of those can be violated by quantum correlations. Now, is this a convincing experiment? Of course, we do not realize Wigner's original thought experiment, which involved a conscious friend. And that's why we call it a proof of principle. It has a very simple friend. In the role of the friend is played by the path that a photo takes, and the friend has only one bit of memory, so to speak. On the other hand, it's a mathematically precise representation of the scenario in the sense that the observer degrees of freedom and the system degrees of freedom are represented by tensor factors of a Hilbert space, and the measurement leads to entanglement between the observer and the system in the appropriate way. And if one considers that any physical system is an observer, for example, in the relational interpretation, this is good enough. Andrea Di Viaggio and Carlo Rovelli uh, recently said, remarkably, these inequalities have already been shown experimentally to be violated for the case in which Bigness friend is a single photon. One might be attempted to dismiss the result on the ground that photons do not generate facts, but this opens the problem of deciding which systems give rise to facts. But we are non-committal to that. An experiment could fail to validate the inequalities at some level. That's for nature to decide. 
But of course, the question is, at what level would that happen and, and why? Now, the ultimate experiment that uh, as I was mentioning in the beginning that we can envisage would be one with a human-level AI in a huge quantum computer. So, so long as human-level artificial intelligence and universal quantum computation are both possible, which I think um, probably most in the audience would believe, it should be possible to violate these inequalities with agents that we may be strongly inclined to call a friend. And um, this um, ultimate experiment also allows us to prove a, a new theorem, where, which is in this paper in preparation with Howard Wiseman and Eleanor Riffle, where we further break down that assumption of absoluteness of observed events um, to uh, include this very specific, well-defined experiment with a uh, human-level AI. So those would be in a paper in preparation. Now, but much before this ultimate experiment, which who knows how long that will take, in decades, maybe a century, uh, I think it would be very interesting to realize experiments with quantum agents of increasing complexity and increasing functionality. Um, say some interesting milestones would be simple reflex agents in the sense of artificial intelligence, decision agents that may use quantum mechanics as a guide to action, quantum learning agents, etc., all the way to human level AI. And um, an even more interesting situation would be one where we have a community of agents, which within which I what I call a Vigna bubble, and we'll discuss some of that in this recent paper, um, because that would allow us to make within this community allow us to make operational sense of probabilities for these agents and to an interesting question is how can we conciliate the the description from the, the friends perspective from the, the description from an outside perspective a standard operational quantum mechanics makes an essentially fixed heisenberg quad with the quantum world on one side and the observers on the other and it doesn't equip us to deal with um, interacting coherent quantum agents and this is a problem that um, would be interesting to deal with much before we have human level AI. And uh, what our no goal theorem, like that of Frau Hienrena, shows is that to deal with this kind of scenario will require some kind or other of radical revision in the standard quantum formalism. Will any of that be eventually useful for quantum technology? I don't know. But judging from the past interactions between quantum foundations and technology, I think that's a, that's a reasonable bet. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Eric. That was a, a, a great talk, uh, very thank you. fascinating. Um, so I think I'll just have a double check. So do we, uh, so we have one, we have a couple of questions, uh, which I'll I'll read out now. So the first one is from Bullzan George Andre. And he says, as far as I can see, the experiments you presented are imaginary like Schrodinger's cat. Uh, can these be done in real life? Um, well, if you believe that human level AI and universal quantum computation are possible, then yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, I have a, a not second. Today, but Sorry. I think most people in, not today, but most people in the audience would say yes to both of these propositions. Yeah. Okay. I, I fully agree with you. So I'm not going to uh, uh, say anything else. Uh, and then we have a second question from David Shaw. Uh, who asks, uh, can you say more on the potential connection between demonstrating different levels of violation and certifying uh, quantum random number generators or even quantum key distribution? No, unfortunately not. Um, I have been waiting for um, for Eric uh, Woodhead and uh, Stefano Peroni to, they, 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 they've been needing to publish a paper um, extending on these uh, on these results. In, the, in, the, in their thesis, they they focus much more on the technical aspects of exploring these polytopes, but not so much in in the actual implications for for um, remnants uh, certification. So I actually just recently asked them uh, if they, they found any issues or it's just a matter of lack of time. And they said, yeah, it's just lack of time. And they're planning to write it up soon. So hopefully we'll we'll see more of a discussion there on the archive. And uh, yeah, I haven't myself thought too much about it. I'm waiting to see what what they're going to put out in, uh, um, but yeah, there's not much out there yet. But so just at a very high level, is, do, is the expectation that this might give us a stronger randomness generation schemes? Do you know, or is it just kind of complementary ones? Is how do how should we understand it? I, I think it's a matter of, uh, that that's part of the question which I, I was waiting to to see a little bit more clarification. But I think it's a matter of making weaker sets of assumptions. Okay, 
So in that's a sense, stronger, stronger in the sense of using less assumptions. Yeah, that's my understanding. So I had a couple of other questions. So one thing that occurred to me. So in the we, we know that with say non-locality and entanglement, things get even more complicated and and complex when we go to more parties. So is there any scope for having you know three or would anything interesting happen from the context of Victor's friend if we had kind of three labs? Is there anything to expect, or you think it would just be kind of a trivial? I, thing um, well, there's 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 various di different um, ways in which you can think of having three labs or, or multiple agents there. Um, for for one, just having three, say Alice, Bob, and Charlie, each one of your, their own friends, for example, say, then uh, you might be able to prove something like a, a, a GFZ type result. Um, intuitively, that's that sounds plausible. That something like that would come out, um, or maybe some different configuration, as the case may be. I think one interesting res implication of that foundationally is that um, we would have a theorem which doesn't need to make any assumptions about probability theory. That would be a possibilistic. Uh, yeah, result. Okay. So I think that would be in itself interesting, even though it, it may not be experimentally testable, it, it would be logically interesting for for, for that for that uh, for the reason. Great. Um, yeah, but it, like, yeah, I, I, and also you can imagine concatenated uh, friends, and you can imagine to, um, yeah different kinds of situations. And some of these we are starting to think about and see what the implications may be. Yeah. So I think Great. yes, that, that, that there's probably going to be different implications by looking at more complicated scenarios. Very interesting. And just one very, I mean, a little bit more technical question, but so do we understand what the, the quantum boundary or do we run into the same type of issues? Is it is it kind of a, is it a complicated boundary? What quantum can and cannot achieve? And is there kind of a post quantum version of this or or we or not? Sorry, what was the question exactly? So I guess I'm I'm wondering, you know, we, we know that with say Bell, with CHSH violation, we, we could in principle see we could go beyond what quantum mechanics can achieve and, and understanding the quantum boundary is notoriously difficult. I just wondered, right. is, is it the same in your case? Do we, we have the same problems? Is to understand it... the, the quantum boundary itself? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I would expect it would be just the same level of difficulty. Yeah. OK, and actually, there's one uh, more question that's just come in from Erica Anderson. Uh, so she asks, can we now, based upon the LF result, uh, say something about whether quantum mechanics violates the standard locality or reality assumptions or both. Uh, sorry, we nature. Can, the nature does. Right. Uh, we can we can say that it is not enough to reject outcome. You can think of the standard locality as being local causality, Bell's notion of local causality, which um, it can be thought of as a conjunction of what we call locality, which is out parameter independence and outcome independence. So our result says that rejecting outcome independence is not enough. So just saying that it's we don't have action resistance, we have passion resistance, that's not enough. So either you have to really reject locality, accept something like uh, the non-local hidden variable theory, like point mechanics or something like that, or reject absolute of observed events, uh, meaning that if this scenario can be realized, then events will be relative to either as in many worlds, relative to a range of the wave function, or as in relational quantum mechanics, relative to a physical system. Um, but um, not events themselves would not be absolute. So maybe one way, one way of thinking about it, if that's the route you take, which is the most compatible with relativity, would be to say that in relativity we found that space and time are relative, but events were still absolute. And these results suggest that the only way to uh, conciliate uh, quantum mechanics with relativity is while keeping no action at a distance, is to add more relativity to the story, to have even events being relative. Great. Well, and, and that conclusion is arrived at in, in a theory-independent way, essentially. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, I think we should uh, bring it to a close there. So I, I thank you on behalf of everyone again for the, for the fantastic talk. Um, thank you. Yeah.